Attention please, here is a special announcement. It is with very deep regret that we have to announce to you, contrary to claims made by some members of the general public, that punk is dead. Punk is attitude. It's nothing to do with what your record sounds like or what your music sounds like or what music you listen to or what clothes you wear or how old you are. It's an attitude. And it's having the sus to know what matters and what, what doesn't matter. And 99% of the around us doesn't matter. Punk's not dead because he doesn't belong to anybody, but he's still an important cultural force, especially if you go to even China now or India or, or South America. It means something to somebody. On the other hand, it doesn't really matter whether it's alive or dead. I mean, people take what they want from it whenever they want. What can you say about punk rock that isn't good? Everybody thought they were out to cause evil. When they weren't, they were just anti-establishment. But what were they doing for us in them days? They were making all our mothers and fathers unemployed. It will never die, not in this town. The do-it-yourself mentality was definitely a core principle which made punk appealing. And I think the whole scene has become much more complicated in the post-millennium period because of the rise of digital music. But that indiness, that do-it-yourself spirit has survived for four decades. Punk rock is 40 years old this summer and still thrives as an ideal for living. London Calling by The Clash was a clear entreaty to the faraway towns where Joe Strummer invites you to come out of the cupboard, you boys and girls. And they did. Thousands, if not millions, of disgruntled, discarded provincial kids. When this punk explosion happened and we had the Sex Pistols and The Clash and The Damned and these bands in London, it wasn't long before the tremors of that earthquake were spreading northwards. And so, yes, I think perhaps... The provinces have been quiet on the musical front for a while, so punk had an extra intensity, an extra excitement about it for, for those of us living in the north. John Robb was living in Blackpool in the mid-1970s when punk galvanised him to set up a fanzine and form his own band, The Membranes. I know a lot of the original people in punk think it was the provincial spoiled punk. It was OK till the provincials got into it. I was going, well, what's a provincial? They're not your provinces, you know. <laughs> it's a horrible term, isn't it? We're at like, the last corner of the empire, are we? Oh, somebody from London. <laughs> and also, that punk actually got good when the provincials got it because we actually totally believed in it, whereas everyone else had, were like Bowie Roxy fans and it's just a fashion for four weeks. We, we thought it was a revolution, you know. We, we totally misinterpreted it. Yeah. Why did we need it more than they did? Because we were bored, really. It wasn't, and it wasn't Tower Block Rock. It was, we were a lot of people to punk with students as well. It's a mixture of people to punk. It's not this idea that it's all kids from the council estates and it had to be this and this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cliche glued on afterwards. It was all different people like punk, wasn't it? Paul Cook, drummer with the Sex Pistols, recalled the band's impact in the regions when we met up in a busy cafe. We'd done a few shows just in the home counties and then... There were some gigs booked uh, up north, as we would say at the time, you know, which were way up north uh, in Yorkshire and Doncaster and Scarborough, places like that. And that, that was the first time, really, we uh, ventured way outside of London. I think the furthest north we'd been was probably Hampstead at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was like, it was like, oh yeah, we're going up north, this is going to be fun and exciting. We tapped into something straight away, and I think wherever we went, it influenced a lot of people, and um, I think they all came screaming out of the, the terraces or the, the flats, you know, and uh, it was something they could engage with, and it just struck a chord straight away. Largely unknown, the Sex Pistols' first show outside the London area and their last ever in the UK were both in Yorkshire. I pulled up on a country lane about a mile or so from North Allerton on a rainy afternoon, where on Wednesday the 19th of May 1976, the Sex Pistols played their first ever concert outside the conurbation of London. That was a good six months before the release of their first single and their infamous appearance with Bill Grundy on the Today Show. 
it's the county town of North Yorkshire. We've got police headquarters, um, library, and the farming community bank in this town. And there's some large farms in the area and quite wealthy landowners around. So it was known to be the richest town in Britain. Steve Williams was in Sayers Nightclub on that early summer evening in 1976, where his friend Brian Simpson was the resident DJ. Recent bookings had included The Searchers and Wayne Fontana and The Mindbenders. They sounded like this. And this. It was quite a small club. It always had a good atmosphere and it was very well supported. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I think, if it'd yeah. be fair to say, wouldn't it? Yeah, and the bands played on the on the dance floor. Yeah. And there was a little uh, no stage. stone wall around it. Yeah. It was a half circle dance floor, plumb bang in the middle of the club. I used to be the DJ for the night for the owner, Bob Lloyd, and he asked me to play with this uh, band that was uh, travelled up from London, and they were a different sound. <laughs> Announced them three times, and nobody appeared. Uh, called one of the doormen into the uh, DJ booth and said, where's the uh, band? And he said, they're over there asleep. So I said, do you mind going over and giving them a kick on the legs and get them up onto the stage? All I can think it maybe was part of the act, but the, the management didn't inform me or the band didn't inform me prior to the show. And when they came on, people were just leaving the place because they'd never heard anything like it before. I wondered what the hell was going on. And then it was like two weeks later, you know, I'd opened the music paper and I thought, I'd seen these people in town two weeks ago. Did it have any impact on the town, this gig? Did it, was it the arrival of punk thereafter? Nobody knew who the Sex Pistols were at that point. They came and went, and it was months, if not a year or so later, before punk really took off. North Allen's quite a safe, posh little town, yeah, for want of a better term. Market, market town. It's a, yeah, it's a typical market town, and you know we, we're still 20 years behind everything now. So at that well, you point, were ahead of the country. we were ahead of the game, yeah, but we didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, we were at the sharp end of punk. Yeah. <laughs> As kind of guys in middle age now, yeah. how often are you asked to reel out the story of the night you saw the pistols? This is the first time. <laughs> I think pretty much, yeah. I've mentioned it a few times, but people didn't believe yeah, me. You no, know, it falls on stony ground a bit. <laughs> what do you think the old punks have turned into? Middle-aged bloke. <laughs> I fancy that. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, on the walk with Steve to find where Sayers was based, it's now called Club Amadeus, incidentally, we came across a burly middle-aged ex-punk called Peter Jackson on his way for a lunchtime pint. So you were here at the 76 gig? Yeah, I, was yeah. Really, I shouldn't have been there because I was only 13, stroke 14, but me and a couple of lads got in. What do you remember of the night? They were absolutely out of this world. Changed my life forever. So I'm still a punk rocker to this very day, thanks to that night there. Why? What, well, it's just their attitude and just the way they thought conformity, you can go do that. You're not dressed like a punk now. What would you, what would you have looked like? 40 years ago. <laughs> you name the colour hair, it would have been any colour and every. Leather, stud, tartan bondage, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why didn't I know it? Come in, I've just literally just taken my stiff little finger t shirt off. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't wear the bondage trousers or anything anymore, no. <laughs> you know. I've moved on a little bit. Music, that's all I listen to punk rock, through and through punk. Right. Through and through. We've all got all the siblings. We had to listen to their crap, which was the Eagles and the Free, and yeah. because, you know, we don't want to listen to that when we're nine and ten year old. No. But that's what we had to do. This has long been the received wisdom that punk was an essential response to a safe, stale music scene where virtuoso playing decorated escapist songs. I grew up in a Lancashire mill town where one of the first and staunch converts to punk was Andy Thorley, who still tours performing his poetry as Andy T. I paid him a visit. All right, yeah. you're OK? Yeah. How are you? It's OK. It's okay. All right. 
people used to sit on the floor at gigs around that time so I think people just sit on the floor and listen nicely maybe clap the end of the songs but most of the time audiences were just very sedate so I think punk changed all that people was starting to wake up again and do things for themselves and I don't know what it was whether it was like a collective unconsciousness or something but a lot of people seem to get the idea from those few gigs that anybody could do it sort of thing and suddenly everybody was doing it do you think there was something particular to your background that made you more susceptible to it or to understand it so quickly music i suppose just being into music from a very early age and and getting that outsider feeling as well of uh, of not really belonging and um, finding an outlet in music simon warner a lecturer in popular music studies at the University of Leeds, explains how this aesthetic caught fire. I think there was a sense that it was a street music, it was a ground-level music. The rock business by the early 1970s had become this multi-million pound monolith. I think there was a sense that popular music had become much bigger than the ordinary fan. And punk seemed to have that roots street level appeal to it you were able to mix with the bands before they played in clubs in Manchester or Sheffield or Liverpool you you might be able to catch them afterwards and speak to them there wasn't this same sense that there was a barrier between the big stars and the ordinary fan do you think you went deeper than that in terms of forming a creed for people I think it might have done for some individuals I mean the, the confusing thing about punk was that it had elements of the far left and at times, worryingly, it had elements of the far right. It was, a, it was a mixture of things. So it was quite a confused scene. This idea of anarchy at the heart of punk, it seemed to be one of the driving principles. I mean, I think that sort of excited young men, middle teenagers, later teenagers, in anarchy, I think they saw something um, wonderfully anti-establishment. We was kind of on a bit of a quest, I, I guess, to spread the word, as it were. And so... And we were just uh, happy to get in the van. It was all a bit, you know, just jump in the back, back of the van and get in the transit and up the M1 on a, you know, cold and frosty, rainy afternoon. And we looked at it as an adventure. Use the word quest. If you could summarise what the quest was, what was it you were taking out there, did you feel? Well, I guess the punk ethic was very, very simple message. It was like, if you're not happy with the status quo, don't just sit about moaning. Get out there and do something about it yourself. Very DIY, if you like. And I think we tapped into a lot of unrest in the country. When we went up to North Allerton and played Scarborough and Doncaster, places like that, there was a crowd there that related to us and was really into what the, the punks were doing and the pistols were doing and our message. It was either you really hated us or you were really into it. There was no, no in-between at the time. I had a nervous breakdown when I was 12. I was sectioned by my mum and ended up in uh, Birchill Hospital in Rochdale in the secure ward. And uh, when I got out of there, I left home. So I suppose I grew up fast. I was living on my own by the time I was 15. Um, I'd written a lot when I was in hospital and it was just an expression. And um, it was always music and words um, I used to read a lot. I used to spend a lot of time in libraries, skiving school. I hated school and it hated me back. To me, over the years, you've hardly compromised and you've lived whatever punk was meant to represent. Do you feel that? Um, I don't know, really. I've always lived by my own credo of uh, you know, not harming others and, and being nice to people and expecting the same back. Nobody ever called themselves punk, did they? People would say, I'm a punk, wear a badge, I'm in the punk club, here's the rules, I'll do this, this and this. I mean, everyone was really awkward, weren't they? People go like, this punk thing's really amazing, but I'm not in it. So you're in it, but you weren't in it, because that was the only youth culture, in a sense, that it never actually existed. In a way, there was no such thing as a punk. As someone who's observed you from a distance over the years, I also admired your graft. I know we can't define what punk is, but that seems like another element of it. In other words, living life to the full. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, is yeah. Is that something you did consciously, or are you just a grafter by nature? I thought about this the other day, and I suddenly realised that my whole family's like that, really. My brother and my sister were really hard. My sister is um, 
Kofi Annan's well, his system, but really they're actually joint and he's cut charity. So, so he, he relies on her. Right. And Bob Geldof's involved, and Geldof's terrified of my sister. It was quite weird because I met Geldof backstage at a festival playing. Yeah. And he goes, I know your sister, you know. We're terrified of her because she's really bossy and she works non stop and she makes them all feel uh, really lazy. And I thought, oh, God, well, that's what we're like, isn't it? <laughs> Punk stood as a life choice for both men and women. Rock and roll cultural historian, Dr Jennifer Otter Bickerdyke. It was this idea of a woman could be in control. So the woman as the visible front figure, whether it be for a band, whether it be on the boardroom, whether it be as a public figure, all of those things punk opened up, blew, blew the doors off for women to do, pushing against what you're, how you're expected to be and what you're supposed to look like. I think even now, having Hillary Clinton on the bill for the presidential election in America, that is, whether she wants to be or not, totally a descendant of punk rock, the ability and the feeling that it is possible. That's what punk really gave to not just women, but to everybody. Just 17 months after visiting North Allerton, the Sex Pistols played their last ever British date at Ivanhoe's in Huddersfield on Christmas Day 1977. Stephen Dorrell was one of the organisers. Malcolm McLaren rang up and said, uh, would you like the Sex Pistols to play on Christmas Day? And I said, yes. So I went home for Christmas. Uh, I forced my parents to have Christmas dinner in the morning and we sped up the motorway so we were there from the afternoon uh, I was supposed to look after the Sex Pistols uh, see that they were okay and all the rest of it and I remember going in and the, they were downstairs and they were drinking and I was, we were all drinking and I thought this is the most ridiculous job ever <laughs> who could ever think of a job of somebody looking after the Sex Pistols Huddersfield became a rallying point for clued up teenagers from all over the country Mark Burgess, who later forged a lifelong career as frontman with the band The Chameleons, headed there from his home city of Manchester. They were a breath of fresh air. Man, they were debating the Sex Pistols in the Houses of Parliament as being a threat to the fabric of our society. They were the epitome of rebellion um, against, you know, the stodgy, bloated, redundant establishment. It became a statement it was everything that was healthy about being a teenager. Freed my mind. Unknown to Mark, the Pistols were to play two concerts. The first at a party in the afternoon for the children of striking firemen, which featured a gigantic Christmas cake, and another for the general public in the evening. I went up to the venue and I noticed all the posters outside. And then I saw all these kids like filing in through the door. And then the DJ goes about, it starts telling all these kids how lucky they are, because the Pistols are going to play for them. And he said, they're here. And I, I ran to the, the door and looked out. And the bus pulled up, you know. The door opens and Leiden comes up. And the first thing he does is launch a paper plane out over everyone's heads. All these kids are all kind of going, like, really excited. They all f shambolically fall off the bus. Um, Sid's there and Nancy's there. The whole sh sh shebang, the whole nine yards. So I go back inside, they walk in, and he played. He played. And um, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was almost like a catwalk type deal going to the stage and he starts crawling down the stage. So I don't know what I don't know what I was thinking, but I just I ran up and I grabbed a, a load of cake and I just pummeled it right into his head. I just covered him in cake. And he starts laughing his head off and all the kids, they see this, right? They go, yeah. And they all start throwing cake all over him. So he's just like, the band's playing. He's, he's, he can't function for laughing, you know? getting pummeled with all this cake. Yeah, it was just a spur of the moment thing. He was like thinking I'm a bloody mess and we made him one, you know. <laughs> John Crook lived in Huddersfield at the time. He took me to the building which had once housed Ivanhoe's, but he's now home to a supermarket. Now this is the kind of guts of where the, uh, the gigs took place. Uh, we're wandering down the veg, the veg aisle. And, um, there's a term called psychogeography where you're, uh, you're sort of referencing places and the feelings you get from those places, amongst other things. And I sort of wander down here sometimes and I just think, well, 
all those kids on Christmas Day, you know, getting the, the presents from the pistols and what was going on with the people. And now it's, uh, it no longer exists. When you're wandering around Little, do you sense that anybody else is having the same thoughts? <laughs> I'm not sure, because I think the clientele is quite mixed, actually. I think uh, most of the people wandering around here don't have any idea of the place that it used to be. While many took a positive message from Punk, some turned the energy to hostility. Violence broke out at a concert by Adam and the Ants. Listen, boys, just cool it, eh? OK, so you're all tough. How about a one-on-to-one, eh? Instead of, like, ten of you onto one person. Right, the police are on the way down now, so if the troublemakers want to leave... Let's have them out and let's have a gig on. Otherwise, there's nothing happening. There's only one people in The 1970s were harsh times. Martin Richardson, an academic, is working on a project about punk with John Crook. The kind of hardships that were going on in, in the provinces, I mean, you've got the, the winter of discontent, you've got disputes going on through the 1970s. It was an, an expression and kind of an, showing an awareness of what the state was causing. I think the fact that there was, there was so much discontent, you know, there's obviously things like unemployment, a lot of racism. I just think society was skewed in a certain way, and it had been that way f- for a long time. And they could see how things were fermenting, you know, out of the sort of early 70s, mid-70s um, squatter scene, the sort of political scene, and they could feel something was coming. When we went up north to North Allerton, Scarborough, etc. Paul Cook of the Sex Pistols. There was quite a hostile reaction to us, you know, and like we'd come outside a, a gig, I remember once, and the band tyres had been slashed, or, you know, people were quite aggressive towards us when we were playing, you know, like trying to get us off. I mean, we, we were quite raw at the time as far as music goes, and, you know, you could tell the hostility, like, you know, the people wanted us off the stage and thought it was a racket. Well, you've got to understand, we were just playing like kind of working men's clubs as well sometimes up there. So it was like, it was a bit like um, the Blues Brothers, you know. We should have been playing behind the cage, really. And like things were come fly, flying across, across the stage and, you know, there were people shouting at us and stuff like that. Were you ever actually afraid? We had a bit of a siege mentality about us at the time, so... You definitely had to watch your back. When we played a lot of places, we'd always have our mates with us who were, who were quite handy and could look after us. And I th- we did need that at the time. Thankfully, there was no violence when the Pistols struck their final chords before a British audience. They came on stage at Ivanhoe's at about 9.30pm on Christmas Day night, 1977, while most of the rest of the country was watching the Dick Emery Christmas show, followed by Stahusky and Hutch. Julian Goodall managed to get himself a ticket. That's the ticket, Mark, and uh, it's £1.75, which obviously wasn't a lot of money, but uh, I got ticket number 50. They were numbered from 1 to 300. Um, I remember turning up in a black blazer, black trousers, spiky hair, uh, queuing up, going in. I was right at the front of the stage. Um, Johnny Rotten handed me the mic, and I was actually singing into his microphone one of the songs and it was just as a young teenager i don't think i realized what i was witnessing really it was just uh just a good concert at the time you know and really no trouble really enjoyed it come and get your punk in woolworths bondage trousers 12 pounds mohair jumpers sold next to cardigans it always comes around they turn it into a joke anything that threatens them turn it into a dog or a cat that they can stroke and couldn't bite its own tail They make it safe. That was Make It Safe by another punk poet, Patrick Fitzgerald. The blanding out of punk, along with the notion of selling out, has formed a lively discourse over the years. The spoof public announcement about punk being dead at the beginning of this programme was created by the anarchist band Crass, who sang, well shouted, Punk became a movement because we all felt lost, but the leader sold out and now we all pay the cost. Firstly, I want to give you Mick Jones' explanation of selling out. Somebody in America says, uh, so do you think the Clash has sold out? And he goes, right, this is what it is. You get a venue, it's got 3,000 tickets, you put them on sale, they've all sold out, that's selling out. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it with a twinkle in his eyes, it's funny. But it's a great explanation, isn't it? Because there's no such thing as selling out, is there? 
it's also avoiding the question in a sense, so isn't it? You know, well, it, but it? Philosophically, what, what do you but, see but, as selling out? So, selling out was, it was a, a thing that the music press put on the bands because I don't, I, I actually don't think any of the bands actually did sell out. You know, Clash signed CBS, power to them. You know, I, mean, I know CBS is the enemy at one level. But I know how hard it is to make music. What do people expect to do? Clash do drive around. Someone actually said this. Why don't they go around a van selling their records to kids all over the country? That's so pathetic, isn't it? Because yeah. they made some amazing records and they've ended up being like a, a, a cultural footnote when they should have been the mainstream bands. Yeah. The bands just give, give you brilliant music and they give you the energy to empower you to do something useful. I don't expect uh, the drummer out of the Clash to, cut, to bring down Parliament or, or, or the government or something. That's not his job. His job is to be a great drummer and to make us feel so empowered, we go and do it, you know. Do I have a punk attitude? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I have the same attitudes towards the establishment. I have the same attitudes towards the uh, musical establishment. I, I have the same attitudes towards the royal family. You know, I read somewhere that uh, the Queen has given her official blessing to 2016 as the year of punk, and I wanted to throw up when I read that. The Queen has given her blessing. 2016, 40 years of punk. She's given a blessing to it. That nauseates me. People have come up to me many times and said, thank you very much, you've changed my life. You know what I mean? I think, well, that's quite a big statement, but, you know, glad to be of assistance and all that. And, uh, and so that just says it all, really. When people come up to you and say that, and, you know, and it's, it's quite humbling. It was the best uh, education of my life, that was for sure. The Pistols and the people who were all involved with it, Malcolm, John, Steve and everyone. And you, you do, I mean, sell out, what is that? Uh, God, we could, people say we could have sold out when we signed our record deal to EMI, we could have sold out, we've done this and that, but, you know, we were just a, a group of young kids working our way through life and trying, trying to make things a better place, really. Meanwhile, Andy T has just returned home after taking his poetry on tour to the United States for the first time. We'll listen to the track tomorrow from his debut EP, released in 1982. How near did we get to the ultimate end? How many suicides and frightened friends? How do you feel when you were your 18-year-old self still banging on there? It feel it feels odd. It feels strange, but it feels like it sounds like another person. But uh, I suppose everybody feels like that when they've recorded something a long time ago. You still relate to the sentiments? So. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Punk, the Pistols, and the Provinces was presented by Mark Hodkinson, produced by Mark Hodkinson and Kenny Weil and was a smooth operations production.